See, we've got a we got a good crowd. I think we'll we'll get going. Um, well, welcome everyone. I thank you for your time and and choosing this breakout session. Looking looking forward to discussing um, and having kind of a, a thriving conversation uh, along the. the same lens. Um, as way of introduction, I'm Melanie Cutlin. I am a managing director at Accenture and I actually co-lead our, our blockchain and multi-party business together with David Tree. Um, I am also a uh, on, I have a role on the board in, in the Hyperledger Foundation. I'm a board observer on Marco Polo Trade AX um, and have been just involved in this ecosystem really since 2015. So quite some time <laughs> playing in the blockchain space. And I, uh, prior to that, I was in an innovation role um, helping startups kind of become accessible and, and available and grow into the uh, enterprise business. And so studying the innovation space and the startup space to me has so many parallels and things that fit in this space around what does a multi-party system look like? Um, it has been just taking off, as all of you know, and all the excitement throughout this throughout this uh, whole session and any of the sessions you've been able to attend. Uh, we had a, a piece of research we put out rec uh, recently that we've been doing for many, many years called our Tech Vision. And the trend that came through this year um, as a new add to the trends was about how collaboration through the chaos from me to we was really core to how we think about technologies, how we think about growth. There was a, a lot of research and materials uh, that came with this um, as we look at kind of what is happening around the world. Um, post in about, I think it was May, our CEO, Julie Sweet, talked to you know, CEOs around the world and more than 80% of them um, were focused on collaboration, right? So how do we get through this crisis through the, the whole lens of collaboration? And so, bringing multi-party systems, which blockchain and multi-party systems had been, as all of you know, right, innovating in the, in the background, this focus on doing it together is the new normal, is the new expectation. It's driving entirely new bis business systems, capabilities and services, and getting that right is difficult. Um, we track over 300 consortiums and events and standards bodies across the world, not events, sorry, consortiums, um, organizations, and standard bodies around the world and, and the progress that they're doing. And so I am happy to answer any questions based on my kind of vast knowledge of our of our hundreds of clients we engage with across the board, but wanted to share just a little bit today about um, really what makes a thriving ecosystem successful. Um, without an ecosystem strategy, <laughs> businesses don't realize the full potential of their digital investments. Uh, what we are seeing is this trend from moving um, you know, from paper to digital, many industries have been making that progress for a long time. And now digital to truly transformative and then industry-wide and getting rid of the walled gardens, right? Those walled gardens of the past that allowed us to drive a business process, say, come join me in doing this digital first um, agenda has uh, been an interesting um, an interesting adaptation, right, of, of how do we do it um, but then this new version of value is where we are in this old messaging based architecture and, and needing to unlock the value between participants. And we've realized as a as an overall economy, we are reliant on each other more now than ever before. And I think it's rewritten the script, right? It's rewritten the script on how do I do a project? How do I bring a product? How do I take it to market? It's no longer about how do I do it together, but how do I engage digitally with those who need to, to work across this uh, across this space? So I have just a couple of slides and then we can just have a conversation um, and share some examples uh, where we are. So if there's any questions you guys have about what we've seen as kind of successful models, um, happy, happy to just uh, take your questions if you're open to come off mute or put them in the chat as we go and I'll keep an eye on them. Um, but really, there's a, a three stage process that we see clients going through when they're looking to do a multi party system. And I say multi party system broadly, right? It includes blockchain, digital ledger technology, and many of the kind of newer confidential compute and capabilities around here. But they identify and look at the landscape and say there's an opportunity that would require a multi party system. We want to work together in ways that we didn't work together in the past. We have a common problem. So we identify those 
um, problem areas that are common, find what the scope of common is, right? Is this an industry play? Is this a vertical? Is this a horizontal? Kind of where, where, is, the, where is the main focus of this problem? And then convening, right? Um, convening ecosystems together to figure out what is the minimum viable ecosystem and the participants that can add shared value while they're thinking about what are the motivations and what are the collaborations. And this is the we all can we all benefit from this you know shared solution. So I we have a common problem together. We benefit from a, a, a of a overall solution. In this convening stage, we've actually come up with quite a, a convening methodology that takes us through phases. Um, it even includes a pre-convening phase because <laughs> uh, we're Accenture and we're a methodology-driven company and that's kind of how we think about things. But, um, but in that, it's before you actually convene the ecosystem together, you've got to identify that there's a business case for many people to participate. Otherwise, it's a SaaS-based model. Somebody provides a service to the market and they consume it as they need to and they move on, right? Why do we need to come together in these new collaborative ecosystems? Needs to take some time and thought around um, how do we um, how do we really ensure that there is value for each of the participants? And this isn't becoming a new extractative model where we're taking value out of the ecosystem um, to benefit one, but really how are we thinking about sharing value across an ecosystem for others? And are there participants in this model that would need to participate in order for the ecosystem to be successful that are not incented to join? And so if we digitize a cross company business process, but this person in the middle doesn't want to play um, in a digital way, right? What, what are those incentives that will ensure that we have convened the right group of parties or the right model of incentives? And this is where in practice, I love to do design thinking workshops. I think design thinking and personas and value mapping was all literally just made for this. <laughs> so if any of you have studied right user experience design thinking, um, it has such a beautiful fit for this um, in this space. And then the, the phase that I see most ecosystems forgetting about is to actually keep thinking about it and helping it thrive. Um, this is where we build, operate, grow the ecosystem, expand, expand with new products and services, and making sure that others can also benefit from the solution. So this isn't just the founders are loving it, falling in love with an idea, they come up with some use cases, but but these ecosystems that need to thrive in the post-production mode. And it's exciting to be at Hyperledger and talking about post-production <laughs> modes because many of our programs are getting to that level of scale, right? When we're getting to, okay, we had enough investment, we had enough funding, we had enough startup activity, we had enough development activity to really build a product that could service a market now, how do we create a thriving ecosystem that does all the things that a startup would do? Um, I think of this in very much parallels to the startup in industry, is that I've got a, pro a, a, com I got a good idea, right? I'm a CEO. <laughs> I'm going to be a future CEO and start my own business. I've got a great idea. I then you know, decide that I'm going to go build this idea. I'm going to bootstrap it and take it through Series A, Series B funding, and I'm going to get other people excited about my idea, right? They're going to bring in money and funds, and I'm going to promise them some return on investment in the long run. Um, and then the best startups succeed when they don't just say, great, my platform is live, I'm done. <laughs> Users have an expectation of new products and services and, and can staying competitive in the marketplace and making sure people don't leave, right, my solution and go to something competing in the market. And I think when we do early, um, early discussions with clients, a lot of them are so focused on day one and forgetting that they're then going to need to build and contain and drive um, a well-governed solution for the market in the long term. And so I think that's what's really unique and different is, is really driving this strategy similar to um, an overall kind of ecosystem. So very um, hopefully obvious, but not talked about a lot, in, in my opinion. Um, from that perspective, I'm just looking at the comments and, and chat here, domestic and international use cases, fantastic. Um, and so as we think about what it takes to make a thriving ecosystem, not just identify, convene, and thrive, but another click forward, it's not having that business strategy, that business strategy that's gonna to continue to unlock value over time. 
um, to think of the stakeholders and what are they looking to get out of these programs so that we create ecosystems that are sustaining for years to come, <laughs> not just, you know, uh, great, I've digitized the process, I'm good to go, I'm going to walk away. Um, and, and we see tons, right, doing their initial press release and their initial programs, but, but those long-term multi-year visions, and it is difficult, right? This is the hardest job to do, is to think about what is the consortium that I'm building, what is that ecosystem that we're bringing together, and what value can you drive across that ecosystem? Who are the customers we're gonna serve beyond our first group of customers? Because most of them know, right? Like, here's my obvious few low-hanging fruit that I wanna go do this together with, but then who are the next set of customers? What are the products and services we're gonna to offer to those set of customers? And perfectly stated to your question here is your operating model, right? Um, I see most consortiums fail because they don't have good governance. Um, and, and that is, <laughs> Um, number one, governance, and number two, business strategy, probably tied at the top. Um, and the two go hand in hand, right? Part of our convening methodology is, did you assign a board of directors? Did you assign actually a new company that's going to come together that has some joint ownership model across multiple organizations? And who is in charge of deciding what's next, right? So what's first is obvious. <laughs> and what's second and third is probably pretty obvious because you you all go in with scope and you're excited. And so the governance has many different um, layers to it. And so I can kind of talk through what, what are those layers. But you need a CEO and a CTO and a CFO that makes sure it's uh, continuing to drive um, new value and thriving throughout, um, throughout the model. So it's, I think, an exciting space to be and to think about what, what do you want your it to be when it's done? Um, is it going to grow up and have its own, will it be a startup someday? Or is it truly just kind of staying a startup body um, in, the, in the near term? So new entities and consortiums serving ecosystems can be done in a couple of different ways. They can be done in for-profit for or they can be done in the non-for-profit space. A lot of the most successful ones I've seen are in the not-for-profit space, interestingly enough. So they're creating the standards, they're providing a platform for the industry, they are driving that value sharing model, and different participants are then able to engage in that. And so those organizations that exist just to serve their members are done with what are perceived in the market as just humble intents, right? And so when you say, I'm gonna create a nonprofit organization, you're, you're more willing to get competitive organizations to stay together and to both participate. Um, and so I think the, uh, if you can just one. Sorry, I have a, have a munchkin knocking very, very patiently at the door. <laughs> Needed a yes, no answer. Um, so the uh, so you know the idea of, of the the friction between a for profit and a non profit company, right? Is is really just what's my goal? Um, I've seen a lot of consortiums that that come up with the big founder led ecosystem. There's a lot of benefits for day one of a founder led ecosystem. They can bring their groups together with them, right? So they have that convening power of you're going to do this because. I way you do business with me and come join me and what they end up doing is disincenting their competitors from joining with them if every time company a is the founding body they have lots of members right joining their consortium um, but company B is a competitor to company a if I know that every time I transact even a penny goes to my competitor I am disincented from joining even though it may reduce my overall cost of ownership, but I'm giving money to someone who doesn't, you know, is not where I'm hoping to give money to. And I think in those competitive solutions and engagement models, that's where the nonprofit space has been more productive in convening um, unlike competitors to come together and drive to a common outcome, which drives new standards, right? So if you think of standard bo standards bodies that have made a big difference in in industries before, take GS1 for food. Moby is doing something similar for the auto industry, right? They're trying to create what is the new vehicle identity standard for what's in a car? And how do I encourage all the auto industries to not just say, here's my digital twin of a car, but actually be able to communicate more actively with a thriving ecosystem of members, like how do I 
pay for, has my smart car pay for a service that it's consuming, right? Um, and, and so it's creating much more of an industry-wide story. Uh, there are plenty of places for um, the need to fill a gap where there's not an existing technology in a more startup-based model. So I think where people are coming straight out with that intent of I'm going to serve the industry, I'm going to help you integrate across an industry, and I'm, I'm going to do this as a service provider to you, so come join my company. It's much more viewed as a vendor or a startup and invest in me so I can almost kickstart the company, keep it going. But it's, it's clear that this company is going to exist to make revenue and serve its members. Um, and so I think it's just what you're starting with that is most important around that. And so I said there would be layers um, to what happens there. So there's the governance layer of what do we do together. There's a commercial layer of how do we share value between this new ecosystem. And there's a technology layer of making technology decisions. So we suggest that most groups have a, um, a business steering committee, a um, so strat strategic steering committee, a functional steering committee, and a technology steering committee. And that we make sure there is a way for each of its members to really understand and make decisions even as you hit a stalemate. I engage with plenty of vendors and service providers and I'm thrilled to say, I think your product should do this. I was uh, on the phone with a, a obvious uh, <laughs> um, you know, office enablement tool the other day and I was like, gosh, I wish, I wish my you know, screen sharing tool would do this. I wish it had a button that did that, right? And I wish our company could convince the vendor to do that. And, and, and there is normal ways to share my user enhancement requests with a vendor today. And you know that it's gonna get on a backlog, right? And that backlog will get groomed and it may or may not get slotted into a future product. And they'll make business-based decisions based on how much, how exciting that product is and how much new revenue that product and feature and function will, will create. So we, we, we're used to that decision-making process when we're looking at vendors. In an ecosystem, there's a bit of, in a consortium, there's often this mindset of, well, I'm a co-founder, so my voice should win. <laughs> so um, the, the idea that there needs to be a way to break a tie and to drive, even though we're all pooling together resources to make this happen, we would need then a strategic steering committee, just to repeat it, right? A functional steering committee and a technology steering committee um, that helps to drive through. And it can't just be everyone gets a voice and everyone therefore gets an expectation to get the outcome. There has to be a, a, a democratic decision-making process with some back to a CEO, a CFO, and a COO that are, that are a CTO that are going to help you really manage the new consortium as a business. Um, because that's what has to be a thriving business at the end of the day. Another piece of governance is what do you do once you go live when there's a support ticket? Who are you going to call? Who's going to fix it? Right? So I love open source programs and I think there's, there's so much room for this in this space. Um, but you also need to have um, if you have a critical service you're providing to your consumer base, whether that's enterprise or consumer, you need to also have the idea of a basic support model. The infrastructure needs to be monitored, right? Who's going to do cross-network infrastructure monitoring? Who's going to, you know, set up, send out the email that says we've got a, uh, a maintenance release coming and you all need to upgrade, right? We're in a distributed system. I can't just call my IT department and say, wait for my Saturday night bug fix. <laughs> and I can tell them to work a funny hour and to be on call and make sure it goes smoothly, right? We have to think about these things in now a new, a new way. You're providing a critical service to your customers. Um, and those customers are often enterprises and, and businesses that are relying on what you've now, right? To drive the consistent value. The worst thing you'd want to happen in a consortium, like I said, company A and company B are competitors, they're, they're coexisting together. If you picked a maintenance window that actually is like the peak usage time of company B, and, and then company A is in trouble, right? Like how, how are you going to get through that perceived you know, PR problem? So the ability to have a governance model that sets up what are my operating model, what does it look like, how does, um, all the way from support to application maintenance to infrastructure maintenance. How does it get monitored? How does it do all the things we do in any of our businesses today? So if you take a startup model and you apply it to a consortium, you end up with all those business thriving ecosystems things you need that are more than just the technology. But don't get me wrong, the technology needs to work, 
<laughs> the technology needs to be redundant, it needs to work, it needs to be cared for, and it needs all of those things that are fairly obvious in any technology solution that I feel like as technologists in this emerging tech space, we get that naturally. Um, but I think that's where it's often less obvious is the, uh, the building the wrapper around it to running it as a thriving business. Like what's gonna happen if six months in, there weren't as many transactions as you thought, and somebody now needs to pay for the support team and, and what are we gonna do, right? <laughs> are we gonna run a marketing campaign and get more users to put more transactions to end up to cover the books, right? Who's taking the liability for, you know, quarter three was low usage and how do we get it back up before the end of the year so we can close our books on the consortium um, or make a new cash call from the members that are, that are parts of those investors. And so thinking about some of those things I think are just as important as finding the right shared value story Right, that you're going to focus your consortium on. I assume all of you came because that's that's important, right? Is you're here because you think there's a share of value kind of across the ecosystem, um, and so I, you know I, it's fairly basic. That's all the slides I had um, of a concept when you think about it. But a lot of people don't stop and think about it, which is why I wanted to have this session to just kind of give you some different thinking. Um, you know, depending on where you are in the process of identifying something, convening something, or already there and struggling with those growth and scale problems. Um, so I'm going to take a breath and read the question. We are in Q&A time, so I would love more questions if you want to come off mute or chat them in the window. Love to end. Ah, okay. Um, so mandate democracy, that's interesting. I'm, I'm curious what that means um, more than than the blurb here. If, uh, if Lester, you wanted to come off mute and talk for a little bit. I'm not sure if everyone can in this platform actually. So I uh, um, would love to ask, answer your question, but I think it was an interest and a solicitation for discussion. So happy to discuss in, uh, in the right spot. Um, there is a Q&A over here. Let me check out this side. Um, Underwrite reticent participants until they get on board. There is a, a lot of strategies like that being implemented. Um, the any net, like if you take platform ecosystems, there is a great book, um, platform economy, a great book of uh, talking about when the whole platform movement came. Right when you've got platforms like Facebook and social media and Uber and others, where they actually don't um, drive the content creators and the content consumers. The idea that you want traffic on your platform, whatever it is for in any industry, if it's supply chain, financial markets, if it's across different um, different use cases, there's often a I need you, so I'm going to underwrite you so <laughs> that I can get you to mass scale. Um, and those types of platform you know, strategies still apply here well of how long do you need to underwrite that? How long do you need to subsidize activity on your market so you get to network scale so that people see the value of the network? Um, before turning it into kind of a more commercial model. Hey, John, welcome. Um, glad to see you here. Can you discuss how multi-party systems can help healthcare organizations in a post-pandemic world? Ooh, that is a, that is a fantastic one. <laughs> um, convening, convening healthcare providers is tricky, right, in a couple different ways. So maybe I'll break it out as to how I think of, uh, I think there's, I think it's three core components of healthcare. There is patient identity, provider identity, there is medical records and histories, and then there's benefits. Um, and benefits have things like accumulators, they have smart language around what are the benefits and who is applicable in which situations. So I guess it's for if you take patient and provider identity, um, then the actual medical events themselves, as well as then the benefits and the accumulators and the applying logic on that. So if you think of those kind of three buckets, I'd say identity, um, services and uh, and then logic, right? Applied for who's eligible for what. There are lots of emotions and activity. I actually love what um, what Many Ledger is doing uh, is getting lots of uh, excitement around uh, medical chargebacks, which are between a pharmaceutical company, the pharmacist, and then the benefits administrators and the number of costs and dollars that go in every direction in that use case, um, which is a clear need for a multi-party system that tracks the ledger of information so that you can follow them backwards without kind of double spending on any given purchase in the in the pharmaceuticals industry. I think it's a great example in a simplified, less regulated space. Um, I do see lots of innovation happening, right? So even take vaccine passports have been a, a great 
um, move in the space where you can carry with you credentials and information about your medical history um, that can then be shared with multiple parties without actually revealing the core information underneath, right? I can uh, have my my uh, coupon from my uh, <laughs> when my oldest just got their vaccine yesterday um, and, you know, gave me the little card and information. And so many places to travel, you just need to know that I can send, that I have, that I have a vaccine, not that all the information about it, right? You just need the yes, no answer. And so multi-party systems are doing a good job of that consent-based architecture as well. Uh, but it really comes down to over time, we will have a better sense of knowing who is the patient, who is the provider. So in any transaction that I transact with, uh, you know, Dr. Smith in Chicago is probably <laughs> many Dr. Smiths, right? That I that I'm billing the right Dr. Smith, that my insurance information doesn't pend because of a, of a disconnect, that my medical records become accessible over time as I get better and better. And much of that needs this offline storage capability, keeping my medical records in its vaults that should be today um, and showing that information. And then um, just like I said, kind of how I accumulate the spend against those activities. Um, I love that last one here, which is what incentives encourage participation, the carrot or the stick. I think that really matters, you know, which use case you're talking about um, and and how long you want to try one versus another. Right. Nobody wants to be incented with a stick for very long. Um, now, unless you're in a highly regulated place where the, the penalty and the stick is um, a penalty for not, you know, but for not providing the right information. I know regulators have been excited about the opportunity to have notary nodes and things that can be seen um, in in different spaces. So I uh, I think the encouragement is hopefully there's a shared value pool where everyone is getting savings, um, but savings is usually not enough, right? You also want to reinvent the process, have it be faster, um, faster, more accurate, more competent, driving down less exceptions in any exception management process. That alone is usually enough to get you started. But then, you, like you said, you have to create more um, features and functions over time that allow you to keep stickiness to them, just like any startup would as you think of the new consortium. So just two minutes left. Um, I'm just going to maybe shift to close. Thank you. Oh, I see one more question popping in, so I'll, I'll read through this one. Um, Um, in a situation where one of the members is being disintermediated, um, I, I go back to kind of core language that if you're a company that's that's not adding value in an ecosystem, right, is, is the time when disintermediation becomes your company should be providing value. Um, and there's often ways people need to reinvent themselves and think about it in new ways. I, I think your minimum viable ecosystem needs to take all of that business strategy into mind of who do I need? And if someone I need is being threatened by this solution, then your business strategy is probably a bit off for how do you start, right? So how do you kind of get started in those spaces? And I'm sure with exact examples, we could go through lots and lots more. But they did ask me to close on time. So I'm going to wrap up from here. I uh, I just thank you. Follow, um, follow, us on, uh, block, uh, follow us on LinkedIn or Twitter or other uh, platforms are excited to be sharing lots. Um, like I said, Accenture is engaging with much of the corporate enterprise landscape, continues to have, you know, insights on how, not just how the technologies are evolving, but how we are using that to create real value that gets unlocked around the world. So excited to be here. Thank you everyone for your time.